All right, Ying Ying, check this out. 拼多多，拼多多，拼得多，省得多。拼就要就要拼多多，每天随时随地拼多多，拼多多。Wow, Ray, are you singing the 拼多多 song? Yes. Apparently, lots of mothers and kids in China love this song. It's catchy, huh? Pin Duo took it from another pop song called "I Miss You," which, yes, you guessed it, is just as annoying as this one. Yes, that's what netizens call the most effective brainwashing song of 2017. I think, ever. <laughs> well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Our loyal listeners will know that we actually covered Pin Duo way back in episode two, when the buzz around this company, at least in English, wasn't the crescendo it is today. It was over three months ago, actually, in late April. But by then, there was already a lot of speculation that Pindledor was going to try to go public, based on a blockbuster 2017. Not just a blockbuster 2017, but a phenomenal Q1 2018. Last quarter, it grew revenues more than 37 times year on year. Do you know what that means? Let me take out my handy Excel spreadsheet here. It means. That that's the same rate of growth if you were doubling your top line every two and a half months. No, two months and ten days. That's growth every startup dreams of. But Pindledo was one of the few who did it. For a company that barely existed three years ago, it's now trading under the ticker PDD on the Nasdaq. That's right. It raised 1.6 billion dollars in a massively oversubscribed IPO on Thursday, July 26, 2018. That's a few days ago, and it surged 40 percent on its very first day of trading. Colin Huang, the CEO with a 46.8 percent stake, suddenly found himself worth 13.8 billion dollars. Investors buy in capital Sequoia and Tencent, from whom Pinduoduo had raised 1.7 billion. Each also stood to net two to four billion dollars each. But even as we're recording this episode, lots of news are coming out about the company that has affected its stock price negatively. The government, for example, just announced that that they will be investigating Pinduoduo's fake goods. At one point this week, it was barely hovering above its IPO price of 19 dollars. What are the challenges? Lots have been said about its success, but we're here to tell you the whole story. Afterwards, as always, please tweet at us at Tech Buzz China to tell us what you think. The president's key economic team goes to China.、Uh, after a whole night thinking, I say I still want to do it. <laughs> Hi everyone, we're Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily, powered by the Syndica Podcast Network. We're a new weekly podcast focused on giving you a peek into what's buzzing within the tech community in China. We uncover and contextualize unique insights, perspectives, and takeaways on headline tech news that don't always make it into English language coverage, so you can be smarter about the world of China tech. Tech Buzz China is a part of PanDaily dot com, a new English language site that tells you. Everything about China's innovation. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Ying Ying Liu, and I'm your other co-host, Ray Ma. Shout out to some of our listeners: Natalie Byer, Elliot Zogman, Mohammed Farid, Mike Bai, and to all those who continue to give us constructive feedback. If you enjoy listening to us, please take the time to leave us a rating or review wherever you find this podcast. <music> Okay, early tech buzz fans, you have already heard this story. But for those of you just now tuning in, let's go over it again. The founding story of Pinduoduo in early 2015, the fastest growing app in the history of Chinese internet, and now I think probably the fastest ever to go IPO, at least on a major foreign exchange. Pin means to piece together, and Duoduo is much, much. So it's been translated as buying more together, and it does exactly what you think it does. Group buying. If you're a true Sinotechnophile or China tech lover like us here at Tech Buzz, you will know that there was some weirdness going on around the founding, because for the public at least, there were actually two companies. 
One was ping duo duo, and one was ping hao huo, which means piece together good goods. They both did social commerce, but ping duo duo was a marketplace where ping hao huo sold fruit and other perishable items via direct sales. But the weird thing was that both companies had the same legal representative, a gentleman named Sun Qin, and the same investor, Colin Huang, Huang Zheng. And in September 2016, the two merged. Sound confusing? Trust us. If you go back to media reports in 2016, everyone was very confused. So you're not the only one. Many reporters dug out the incorporation information for all of the entities involved, and they still couldn't figure out what was going on. Was Colin just an investor? Because that's what the paperwork said. And that's what's great about IPOs, right? Because all this stuff has to be clearly explained. If you read Ping Duoduo's IPO prospectus, you'll see that there's no need to be confused. This is actually the same company. They had the same boss who was Colin. It was just two different and parallel entities that were running adjacent businesses. But why did it do that? Why did it maintain two separate brands? Now, this is not in the prospectus, but the best theory I've seen is that Pinduoduo was originally meant to test which products would be best for group buying. The data it got could then be fed into the Pinhao Hua platform, which does the direct sales. The best evidence for this is that early investors like Banyan actually invested into the Pinhao Hua entity, not Pinduoduo, which was then run under a Shanghai registered company. That's not a theory, though, Yingying. We actually have one of the co-founders of Ping Hao Huo, Wu Mei, telling a reporter on the record that Ping Duoduo was indeed a side project of Ping Hao Huo, and that it was meant to discover what new products their core customers wanted to buy. Ping Hao Huo's core customers were mostly OLs, which stands for white collar office ladies, and they loved fresh fruit. That's the story we went by back in episode two. But why didn't Colin set up an actual entity? Instead, he had it running out of his gaming company. By way of intro, by the way, Colin is a serial entrepreneur and had already been operating both an e-commerce company and a gaming company for a while before trying his hand at Pinduoduo. So now I don't really know what to believe. I personally like the other version better. It's not the first time that what was supposed to be a support tool accidentally becomes the main flagship product. I mean, just look at Slack. But this is not the only part about Pinduoduo that has been confusing for people. I mean, that's actually one of the main reasons Colin has given for going IPO so early. When people asked him, "Hey, what's the rush?" he has responded, "We are a team of engineers, and we haven't dealt so much with the media. In order to establish our credibility, we need to go public." Going public allows us to immediately become more transparent. He's not wrong there. The prospectus doesn't give us the history, but from a business perspective, they were just two different business units, and eventually one of them, Pinduoduo, won out. Pinhao Huo actually ceased operations in the first quarter of 2017. You can see this pretty clearly in the financials. In 2016, 90 percent of the revenues were from merchandise sales, basically the Pinhao Huo fruit sales, and 10 percent from Pinduoduo's marketplace operations. By 2017, though, 99.8 percent of the revenues were from the marketplaces, which is Pinduoduo. In the past 12 months, Pinduoduo has sold 41.8 billion dollars worth of goods. That's what we traditionally call gross merchandise volume, or GMV. It's done that across 7.5 billion orders. That means each order is about six dollars on average. Pinduoduo now has 344 million active buyers and over one million merchants on its platform. As everyone's fond of comparing, that's more users than JD's 302 million, but still behind Alibaba's 552 million. I think those are silly comparisons. JD and Alibaba have been around well over a decade. JD, in particular, has such a different business model. They started off as an e-tailer, not a marketplace. And plus, Pinduoduo is, as Colin is fond of saying, just a three-year-old child compared to these mature companies. Hey, I'm with you, Yingying. But we're in the minority here, unfortunately. It's too bad because, yeah, I don't really see how Pinduoduo is at all comparable to either company. It's also not at all like VIP Shop, which, by the way, is another company it's always getting compared to. VIP Shop, for those of you who don't know, sells discount clothing to Chinese people. You forgot Costco and Disneyland, which is what Pinduoduo put in its own prospectus, that it was a combination of the well-known U.S. discount retailer Costco 
and one of the most successful entertainment properties in the world, Disneyland. Okay, I gotta give Colin points for creativity, but that is simply ridiculous. Ying Ying, please do our listeners a favor here and explain what exactly this love child of Costco and Disneyland actually does. I mean, does it have dancing hot dogs? Huh? <laughs> no, no dancing, no singing, just deals. Lots and lots of deals. So the way it works is pretty simple. As we've explained before, the app offers merchandise that's cheaper than market price by letting consumers buy directly from manufacturers, cutting out middlemen and advertising and other costs. They also add some gaming elements to the shopping experience by giving out coupons and rewards. And if a shopper recruits friends to join them in an eligible purchase, then the entire group gets a discount. Oftentimes, you actually only need to recruit one other person. Our friend Zara Zhang at GGV did a great walkthrough on YouTube. Go check it out. Yeah, they also did a helpful PowerPoint on the company, which we recommend you to take a look at as well. But basically, it does exactly what Ying just told you. But it claims to do this in a way that's entertaining. Colin has said that Pinduoduo is total meets e-commerce. The first sentence in its prospectus says Pinduoduo dedicates itself to being a place where users can find the most value for money merchandise that meet their different needs. And derive happiness. Well, there's plenty of people who believe that shopping brings you happiness. Really, though, does buying eight packs of 300 sheet facial tissues for a dollar forty make you happy? Because that's what's being sold on Pinduoduo. When I think of shopping, I think of Carrie Bradshaw walking down the streets of New York in Sex and the City. I don't think of facial tissue. Well, what if there were hundreds of other people looking at the same facial tissue as you are, ready to buy with you? Okay, that's even weirder. Why would I want to know that? But some people do. That's why Pindoldo has been successful. They're not targeting you, Ray, or me, or probably most people we know. They're targeting people who will probably never go to New York, but do need facial tissue, and they'd rather get a great deal on it in a gamified format, knowing that many others are doing the same thing as them at the same time. Okay, so you're telling me that for people for whom Fifth Ave is out of reach, they'd rather be in this giant virtual flea market. But who are these people? I have had a full WeChat contact list for a while. That's five thousand people, and I'm in hundreds of group chats. Not a single time have I been invited to join a Pinduoduo group by. Nope. That's because most of your friends are not third and fourth tier city residents whose average monthly disposable income is only about a hundred sixty dollars or so. That's also why Pindoldo is often referred to as e-commerce for those outside the fifth ring, Wu Huan Wai, the Di Yi Dian Shang. For those who are unfamiliar, the higher the number, the further away you are from city center. So if you're living outside the fifth ring, that means you're poor. Okay, so we were talking about Pinduoduo's users, who are, to put it nicely, not China's economic elite. They're also seventy percent female and mostly between twenty-five and thirty-five years old. That's prime Taobao demographic, which is why one of the headlines at Pan Daily in April was Alibaba's worst nightmare: Pinduoduo. But is it? Has it built itself an insurmountable lead? Is their model of group buying, or as they like to say, team purchases, so disruptive that it's undisruptible? Well, no. The group buying function is actually pretty easy to copy. While it's true that Pinduoduo has so far been extremely successful on WeChat, WeChat doesn't really provide it with any protective moats. I mean, other players, including longtime ally JD, can do the exact same thing. And in fact, they've already started to do so. JD actually started their group buying product back in 2016, but only really started to push it this year, probably after seeing the success of Pinduoduo. Taobao 特价版 or Taobao Special Deals was launched in March. The thing is, with JD Pingo, you get the same service levels with these discounted items as those on its main site. That means very fast logistics. 99 RMB free shipping and seven-day exchanges and returns. How cheap can these products be then? Between the big e-commerce players, JD has always been known as the premium shopping experience. Them and Tmall, JD's average order size is 400 RMB. That's 12 times the size of Pinduoduo's. That's exactly right, Ray. The prices are cheaper, but it's not that much cheaper. 
This is because JD supposedly still needs to approve of the quality, unlike on Pinduoduo, whose 1.7 million vendors decide what they want to sell and at what price. Apparently, in order to drive volume, merchants will sometimes decide on some ridiculous prices, such as the wristwatch recommended to me for a dollar. Yes, one US dollar. Then find a manufacturer that can make it for the price that they demand. Or maybe they are that very watch manufacturer. They have some excess capacity and want to sell directly to consumers. It's known that Pindodua has salespeople directly recruiting these manufacturers and showing them how to set up shop on the app. Yep. Khaled has actually referred to this as what he calls the supplier's insurance. Meaning, if suppliers are already assured of the demand, then of course they can give the consumers a better deal. I mean, they've removed all that uncertainty and also all the need for the middlemen, right? Frankly, though, he makes it sound a little bit like crowdfunding. It's unclear to me how many of Pinduoduo's products are actually made this way, meaning after the orders have been placed. But Colin has definitely used this concept of pre-ordering, or what he calls connecting the maker directly with the user. As an example of how the platform works. Either way, how can you make a watch for a dollar? You ask. Well, it's easy. Simply modify the item until it doesn't lose you money. Like in the case of this wristwatch, you can see quite a few angry reviews below that the watch face is much smaller than that of a normal watch. That will definitely save you as a supplier on costs. What are people expecting for a one dollar watch? The fact that it even works is mind-boggling. If you go through Pinduoduo's inventory, you really do start to have appreciation for the creativity of the Chinese people. I mean, you'll see phone cases for forty cents, shoes for a dollar thirty-five. As they say in China these days about Pinduoduo merchants, 只有你想不到，没有他做不到 which I'll roughly translate as "You're only limited by your imagination, not by what they can make." <music> We'd like to share two other China-focused podcasts with our listeners. The first is China Business Cast, a podcast from the front lines of business in China. Co-hosts Shlomo Freud and Michael Michelini interview entrepreneurs and business people who've built their businesses in China. They dig into the details so listeners can learn from real on-the-ground accounts of how business actually gets done there. The second is the Harbinger, a Q and A podcast with China's top VCs and tech company founders, hosted by Adam Bao. Both of these podcast guys have great content that really complement what we produce here every week. We encourage you to check them out by searching wherever you get your podcasts. Where were we, Ray? Right, the backlash against Pinduoduo. Yes, there are some lawsuits against the company for fakes, such as people hawking Louis Vuittons and Yeezys on the app. But most of the 10 million problematic listings that the company pulled from its app last year are complaints from more accessible consumer brands, like Pampers or Siemens. Pinduoduo merchants are known for selling Shanzhai goods, you know. Pampero diapers with suspiciously similar packaging as Pampers, or Siemens Electronics, but spelled with an extra vowel or two and selling for about a tenth of the price. Indeed, most of the Shanzhai goods aren't going after high-end brands; they're hurting brands like Truongwei or Skyworth. Skyworth is a sort of mid-market electronics brand in China. They had just set up a store on Pinduoduo last month, but suddenly shut down operations this week. It made waves this week when it demanded that all counterfeit Skyworth goods be removed from the platform and even threatened legal action. Colin, though, was quick to blame this on all the white label manufacturers. Shanzhai makers have also gone after small merchants. There have been many organized protests against Pinduoduo's listing, which you can click through and see in our transcript. Anyway, I kind of want to point out to Colin that this is the opposite of the Costco experience. Costco is not known for Shanzhai; it's known for high quality. Yes, but the argument is that if the diaper doesn't leak and the electronics work, if you're a consumer with limited means, what if you just don't care what the brand label says? In fact, people have combed through some of the user photos and reviews on the Pinduoduo platform, and have noted that the photos show "quote unquote" unimaginably humble homes. That's an euphemism for extreme poverty. 
Unfortunately, we can't show you the photos here, but if you go through our transcript, we will include the links. I really suggest you take a look if you've only been to the tier one or two cities in China. I've traveled to the very rural places in China, and I can say that it really does look like what they show in the photos. Yeah, I'm with you, Ray. But there's been a lot of snarky articles like that lately, and I think it's actually a little out of control. Mostly along the lines of, "So you think China's rich? Look at how poor we are and how crappy most of our citizens live." It's a very divisive issue currently. Some people argue you might be outraged that they're not getting a real Skyworth TV, but that's because you live inside the Third Ring Road and have lost touch with reality. These people are pragmatic. They know they're buying a Shanghai or a fake Skyworth TV, and they're buying it because it's all they can afford. Yeah, I can see both sides. I mean, some people think these people are so disadvantaged. How can you exploit them further by selling them such crappy stuff? While others think just like what you said, these people are well aware the goods are Shanghai, but they have no choice. They just can't afford the real thing. And by giving them a knockoff, even though it's not the real thing, at least it's something. Whereas before they had nothing. That's assuming the product is just a little bit crappier, though. There's another risk. There are some products for which the quality is so poor, or the modification is so severe that it's basically unusable. I tweeted a photo the other day of a face mask that yes, you can put it on your face, but it's actually the size of your palm and covers maybe half of your forehead. Or another guy who reviewed an electric toothbrush and after disassembling it realized there is no way to turn it on. And back to our watch example, how many times are you going to buy a watch that's made for a baby before you realize, hey, maybe save that one dollar instead of throwing it away? Yes, exactly. And let's not go into how dangerous that can be if we're talking about ingested items like baby milk powder. People reported that Pindodo had milk powder for sale for a dollar and ten cents. The headline since been cleared up as simply misleading advertising, but it touched so many nerves because there was a big scandal that killed babies a decade ago, and so people are extra sensitive about that stuff. And while misleading advertising is against Pindodo's rules, does it really have that much incentive to enforce it super strictly? Not really. It makes seventy percent of its revenue off of marketing services or fees from the vendors, and most of the rest in the form of commissions, which are just zero point six percent. In other words, yes, GMV is great, but what Pindled or really cares about the most is vendors paying for advertising. Yeah, if there are too many fake goods and consumers start leaving the platform in droves, it's true there will be no sellers either and no more revenue. But you have to wonder just how much Pinduoduo actually cares about the user experience when even today, after it's already IPO'd, there's no way to leave a star rating on either the product or the vendor. If you scroll through the app, there are plenty of angry comments, but they're pretty well hidden from view. You have to click through a bunch of times to even see them. Anyway, all you can see is actually the number of transactions. That's not the only complaint, though. Nope, that's the bulk of it. But yeah, there's plenty of other complaints. Sometimes the goods don't even arrive, and in the beginning, Pinduoduo's product experience was so poor you couldn't even report that you hadn't received the item. And sometimes customers received a notice that their item was delivered and signed for when they never even saw it. Now I don't know where things went wrong if the merchant was just committing fraud through and through, but the issue for the customer is that it's a lot of hassle to file a complaint when, by the way, the average order is just six dollars to begin with. But what do you expect out of a giant flea market? Except this is a giant flea market where you don't bargain on the price by yourself. You bring a whole gang of friends to do it with you. Ah, you're talking about their kanja or price slice function. I didn't see that covered much in English. It's actually since been copied though by other merchants like Sea Trip. I just helped my friend Jamie hack down her hotel price. I'll explain it for readers who don't know, but basically, some deals on Pindodo can be discounted to free if you invite enough friends to cut the price for you. Literally, they get an invite from you, and you click it and agree to slash the price by a randomly generated amount, and your friend gets the new discounted price. You can see who else has also helped in this slashing, and you feel good about helping your friend save money. Plus, all you had to do was click. Well, all you have to do is register. You mean because this is really Pinduoduo's way of getting your info. 
In WeChat, if you get such a link, this usually means that you have now just authorized their mini program. Otherwise, you can't do any slashing. I study psychology and I think this is just ingenious. Most people think you have to give your friends some free money or credits like PayPal did way back in the day to get them to sign up. Little do they know, it actually works equally well or it may be even better to just ask them to help you instead. That's because we're creatures of social obligation and it's very hard to say no to your friend. I mean, am I really going to say, no, Ying Ying, I refuse to click on this link and help you save money. Although you may not be saving me very much money, Ray. Apparently, the way Pindledon makes sure they don't lose too much money is by first marking up the price. So that $5 item you want is now $25. Your first friend easily cuts the price down to $20. So you start thinking, I can just invite four more friends and I'll get this for free. <laughs> but not so fast. You'll find that the slashes go down exponentially. Your next friend's going to do probably $3 of damage, then a dollar. And soon you're looking at like two cents per friend. Yeah, most people give up before getting to free, probably actually before they even get to the real market price of that item. Exactly. It's not a real deal. It's a game. But there's another gamification trick they're known for too, right? Yeah, the lottery function. Pinduoduo has these special deals where you might need a few dozen, say 39 other friends, to join you in a 40-person Groupon for a super great deal. We're talking about like maybe winning some AirPods. All of you have to pay a 5 RMB deposit for a chance to win this great item. If you don't get to 40 people, you don't enter the drawing and you get your money back. If you do get to 40, you enter the drawing. If you win, then you get the item for just 5 RMB. If not, you get your money back and maybe even some credit to spend in the app. What a deal, right? You're thinking you lose nothing and you get a shot at this amazing prize. Does that sound too good to be true? Indeed. Obviously, there's a trick here because Colin Huang did not become a multi-billionaire by squandering his VC funding. This is actually a highly efficient way to acquire customers because in order to be in the drawing, you need to pay that deposit, which means you need to enter your payment information and mailing address. Bingo! Pindodo now has everything it needs from you, and not only did you give it up willingly, but you got 39 of your other friends to do so too. Thank you, loyal customer. That doesn't remind me of Disneyland, nor does it fit Colin's narrative that the company's advanced AI tech is what's driving all the user growth. Anyway, going back to these raffles, there's a story here. Colin didn't actually go to the Nasdaq bell ringing in New York himself. He sent instead one of these lucky customers who won an iPhone for one cent in one of these drawings. Let's talk about that. He made huge headlines in China for not going to the bell ringing and holding a remote ceremony in Shanghai instead. Yup, he was teased for trying to copy Bezos, who didn't show up for the anniversary bell ringing of Amazon a few years ago. Although he denied that, Colin did channel Bezos a lot when he kept on saying that going public was really not that important, that this is just the first step of many for Pinduoduo. Honestly, as much as we've been kind of trashing his product, Colin comes off like a nice guy. He was basically like, yeah, all these bell ringing ceremonies, they are silly. If someone really wants me there, they can just Photoshop me in. I think what's more telling of his character, though, is his decision not to increase the IPO offering price. Because when it was oversubscribed by 13 times, he actually had the opportunity to increase the price by 20%. But he says he decided not to because it wasn't the right thing to do. Yeah, Colin is all about bun fun, the concept of doing the right thing and the honest thing. It's even written to the beginning of the prospectus. We may not always be understood, but we always do things out of goodwill and do no evil. He has acknowledged that he pulled it straight out of Google's motto, do no evil. Google was where Colin worked after he got a master's at Wisconsin-Madison in the U.S. And he has always referred to how much he was struck by the company's values. Although we know, of course, that earlier this year, Google actually removed those words from their code of conduct. But we don't really have any real reason to suspect Colin doesn't truly believe in this. It's well known that he has a famous mentor, the Chinese entrepreneur Duan Yongping. In China, Duan is regarded like a god. That's because, while you may not have heard of his company, BBK Electronics, 
or Bu Bu Gao, you most certainly have heard of their subsidiaries. Oppo, Vivo, OnePlus, those are all him. He also has a big stake in Netties. And in fact, supposedly, it's Netties' Ding Lei who introduced Colin to Duan, maybe because both of them went to the prestigious Zhejiang University. Duan is known as a reclusive billionaire and almost never gives interviews. But you know who he loves? Warren Buffett. Actually, I'm not jealous of Colin at all, except that Duan apparently brought him to lunch with Warren when he was just 26 years old. Duan is a huge proponent of creating value and thinking through business problems deeply, just like Buffett. So maybe it is believable that this whole thing about having principles and being patient isn't just an act, but something that's actually really rubbed off on Colin from his mentor. There's no doubt, at least, that compared to other Chinese internet entrepreneurs, he's actually considered to be extremely low-key. Well, our 20 minutes are up. That ended up being a really long story because, let's face it, Pinduoduo is complicated. Let's wrap this up and leave our listeners with some thoughts to chew on. Pinduoduo bulls, like our friend Mark Poles back in episode two, believe that there will always be a great deal of the population who love deals. Honestly, his quote was so good. I think we should just play it here again. Pinduoduo is actually really interesting to me because it uh, is one of these business models that simply would not have been possible even a few years ago. And that's because uh, right, it leverages a large social graph, in this case WeChat, to bring together consumers to discover and participate in, uh, right, in finding deals. So you can aggregate interest at a scale that previously was simply not possible. Right? As you have to remember, these sort of business models, group buying for physical goods, were among the first in commerce that were actually tried back in the in the mid to late 90s, but they simply could not scale because you didn't have an audience that was large enough. You couldn't aggregate interests right, using machine learning or through social mechanisms, et cetera. And what Pinduoduo taps into is what I think is an enduring human need to find deals, right? Uh, people get a, a dopamine rush when they feel they scored a deal. If you look at the top shopping apps in the uh, Android store in particular, but also on iOS, it's the coupon or rebates related apps that are at least three out of the five of the top 10 apps consistently. And this is not about saving a lot of money and saving small amounts of money, uh, relatively speaking, but people love deals. I don't think that's ever gonna change. Okay, my neuroscience professor will definitely take issue with Mark's use of the words dopamine rush, but I agree with him. The customer need has always existed, and it wasn't until recently that the social function could work at scale. This is also something that Chinese analysts have pointed out. Group buying consists of two functions, after all, forming a group and then buying. Buying from the internet has deep penetration in China thanks to Jack Ma and Alibaba. But it really wasn't until WeChat that the group forming part got easier. Pinduoduo, it seems, just put the right product at the right time. Yeah, some investors have told us that, if anything, Pinduoduo just showcases the power of WeChat and social. But on the other side are people like Kathy Xu, the most famous retail investor in China and founder of Capital Today, who really question Pinduoduo's value. Was it to bring happiness to consumers because they like buying in groups? Or was it to save 25 cents on a $1 purchase? Was it to provide an entertaining experience for consumers who wanted to be distracted? Kathy didn't think any of these were revolutionary enough for a truly great business. I think it's because Kathy sees a fundamentally different opportunity in China. She's in the camp of Xiaofei Shengji, or consumption upgrade. It's this notion in China that the hundreds of millions in the middle class are in the process of upgrading their lifestyles. Yes, it can mean that they're going to spend more money, but it also means that they have higher expectations of quality and are looking for a more pleasant end-to-end -end experience. This is the trend we both saw very clearly while living in downtown Shanghai and Beijing. Whereas people like Colin Huang and his mentor Duan Yongping probably see a different side of China. They see what is now being called xiaofei xiachen. Xiachen literally means sinking, but here it's referring to consumption seeping into the lower tiered cities. Maybe it's better translated as consumption creep? Anyway, the government's actually trying to push for a lot of things to Xiachen, such as health services, so this is not a new concept. It's also, as we mentioned, given birth to plenty of other unicorns we've covered, such as live streamer Kuai Shou, and seems to be one of the main strategies of last episode's Hello Bike. 
while one has the word upgrade in it and the other sync, they're actually not opposites and not incompatible. And they're both formidable trends in today's China. I actually think they're mutually reinforcing. But you might choose one over the other as your dominant strategy, depending on where you believe the strengths of your team or product lies. For now, though, Pinduoduo has a heavy burden on its shoulders. Except for JD and Alibaba, most of the Chinese e-commerce players, the so-called Seven Sisters that went public a few years ago, that's Dengdeng, Jumei, Light in the Box, etc., have not done so hot in the public markets. Colin keeps on saying, well, whatever Alibaba had gone through, referring to its scandals with fake products, we will go through and will eventually come out on top. Will they, though? Will this be an Alibaba? Let us know what you guys think. We'd like to give a shout out to our partners at Sub China. In addition to our podcast here with Pan Daily, they publish the excellent Seneca Podcast, a weekly discussion of current affairs on China with journalists, writers, academics, policymakers, and business people. So while we only focus on tech, they really give you the entire overview. Go check them out. <music> Okay, that's all for this week, folks. Thanks for listening. We really enjoyed putting this together, and we're always open to any of your comments or suggestions. You can find us on Twitter at the Pan Daily, and my personal Twitter account is G I N Y G I N Y, and my Twitter is spelled R U I M A. We'll be back here same time next week. Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily is powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. Pandaily dot com is a new English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Our producers are Carol Yin and Kaiser Guo. Our interns are Scott Du and Meng Lu Wang.